So glad you guys are here. We are doing our second day of chapter 10. Remember that your author split up payroll into chapters 10 and 11. It's kind of strange. I've never seen another author do that. Chapter 10 is on or centered around the taxes that we as employees pay into. And chapter 11, you're going to find is a very short chapter centers around the payroll taxes that the employers pay into. Well, the employers, what we're going to do next time, only pays for taxes, and we already know two of them. That's why chapter 11 is going to be so short. So um, I mentioned earlier, Margarita came into class with an excellent question on the homework, the analyze question. So we're going to make sure we go over that during the beginning of class. Um, is there anything else from anyone in the classroom that has something that's thrown them for a loop over the weekend or a topic that we need to make sure that we hit today? Okay, if not, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get on it. Um, if you guys come up with anything that you can think of, just, you never interrupt me. You can just unmute yourself and ask questions. So I'm gonna share my screen here. So. Chapter 10 was all about calculating gross pay, calculating all the taxes and deductions that you and I have taken out of our paycheck, and then calculating net pay. And we did cover a lot of that last time. Today, what we're gonna be doing is the same thing we did yesterday, except instead of doing the payroll for one person, kind of off to the side like we did last time, we'll be using a payroll register, which allows us to, um, do the payroll for the whole company. I think the one problem we have has four employees in it. And instead of, you know, doing it a long and drawn out in a vertical format, we're going to have a single line in the payroll register where we'll, we will compute the payroll for those various employees. And once again, we'll go over the fairly long journal entry um, that, that you see either on the screen or you'll see shortly on the homework. So let me go to the PowerPoint. You guys have access to these PowerPoints in the modules link. And also, if you haven't yet downloaded the Excel files for today, make sure you do that as well. Um, I've only selected a couple of these slides to kind of jog our memory on what we covered last time. Um, and then we will get to getting our hands dirty. One thing I didn't put up here that I forgot about is an agenda, but I might have lost it. Looks like I lost it. The agendas um, in the modules link, you can go take a look at that. So back to the PowerPoints here. Um, I left the learning objectives up because I think it's a good recap of what we're doing in the chapter. We learned about two laws related to payroll. I hope you can remember what they were. One was the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. I will not ask you what year it was drafted. And the other one was the FICA, the Federal Insurance Contributions Act of around the same time. Those two laws are the overreaching bounds that we're using in this chapter. Again, all states have different state laws as well. So your author is doing this from a federal perspective. We also need to comply with um, laws from the state of California. So those were the two laws that we talked about. Last time we were here, we learned what gross earnings were and we learned how to calculating, calculate them. That's where that Fair Labor Standards Act comes in. Recall that that law has a lot of things in it, but one of the main things it said is if you work more than 40 hours in a work week, your employer has to pay you overtime at time and a half. So we practiced that last time and we'll practice it again today. And then we learned about mandatory deductions, those things that you and I have to pay into, even though we might not be so happy about doing so. Specifically, we learned about social security tax. We learned about Medicare tax. By the way, I think in our notes last time, we wrote down that those two taxes are what comprises the FICA, the Federal Insurance Contributions Act. Um, and also are highly controversial right now. So you may hear a lot of political um, discussion, which needs to take place. Something has to be done to salvage the Social Security and Medicare tax system. The answers tend to be really political because it means imposing higher rates 
or making people pay into the system for a longer period of time. And nobody likes tax increases. And so there's always pushback from the voters, but it needs to be addressed. We also talked about last time on that same note that I've seen this with my own eyes and my own family. If you rely on social security to fund your older years by itself, and that's it, you will be a poor older person in the state of California. And so I try to encourage you guys to think about things like 401k plans. By the way, based on some excellent questions that people posed in the chat room last time, um, I also added a link in the handouts module to an article that had lots of different options for you to look into to retire. Um, I think it was Nick that asked a question about Roth 401k plans and Roth IRAs. Those are great questions. So I put a link in there that you guys might want to take a look at if you're interested. Of course, I'm always available for you to come into my office and talk about that as well. We learned how to do the deduction for the federal income tax that all of us are required to pay into. And we said that that law goes back to biblical times and that instead of having a tax collector at your door once a year, now we've developed this pay as you go system. We said that the publication was 17. We said that the table itself was called a circular E. We learned about a W-4 form that all of us have to fill out and give to our employer to tell the employer whether we're married or single um, and to list the number of exemptions that we want to claim for income tax withholding purposes. We'll take a look at that table again today. So that was a goal. We, we did work on that last time. And then what we haven't yet done, this is what we're going to focus on today, is how to record those things, not just on a piece of notebook paper, kind of like what we did last time, but actually use this thing called a payroll register. So we're going to introduce to you today to the payroll register. And then that section three, recording payroll information, we've talked about the only way to get transactions into the accounting system is through some type of a journal entry. In this class, we're using a general journal. So there are some hefty journal entries for payroll, which we'll review again today. And then there's also a lot of documentation that takes place in the payroll process. I know some of you have just seen it from an employee perspective. It seems like, you know, it seems like we have to fill out. I remember getting my first job or even starting to work for another entity, most recently a publisher. Oh, long story. But to fill out the load of paperwork that they give you um, as someone that's going to be working there is incredible. I'm not going to ask you guys to fill out any forms, but I do expect you to be familiar with the basic forms. Like, for example, I expect you to know that a W-4 is the withholding allowance certificate. And that's where we tell our employer how many exemptions we want to withhold. Hold. And I do expect you to know that that W-2 form is the one that you get at the end of the year, which shows how much you've made and the taxes withheld. So there's a lot of forms in these two chapters. Again, I won't ask you to complete any of them, but I do expect you to be familiar with the names of them. And then there's lots of accounting terms that are new in the chapter on payroll. So I think that one slide is a pretty good summary of what the whole chapter encompasses. Any questions from anybody? And I cannot see the chat room. So um, Sandra or Giselle, if you could help me out, I'd appreciate it. There's no questions, but Amber did state that she's a bit confused about the cumulative earnings in chapter 10. Oh, good. I'm glad Amber stated that. Um, somebody else had a question about that as well. So that's one of the things that I'm going to focus on with you for um, 10 1b, which we're going to revisit and take a look at because Margarita also had a question. And 10 2b, the payroll register that we're doing today, we're going to recalculate that. So I will answer that, Amber. Glad you put that in the chat room. We'll address that as well. Okay, the rest of these slides was just to refresh your memory on Social Security tax as part of that FICA law. I did write in the 2021 maximum. I won't ask you to remember it, but it is 142,800 this year. Once you hit that earnings level, you don't have to pay taxes in as far as social security goes for the rest of the year. 
However, don't forget that unlike Social Security, Medicare doesn't have any maximums. They removed them. I think it was 1996 when they took the maximum off. So if we make a million dollars, we pay in taxes on whatever we earn as far as Medicare goes. And then we also mentioned that there are state and local taxes. Not all states have an income tax. I mentioned several last time that do not. And I see friends, I'm 57. I see friends that are a little bit older than me leaving the state for a variety of reasons. But I think the biggest one I've heard is that California has very hefty income taxes And the ones that I know that have moved out have moved to states with no state income tax. Um, Again, there's pluses and minuses on both of those, but I'll let you decide decide that. Um, California, to me, is a very beautiful state and is worth the increased taxes we pay, but I get that housing is unaffordable in many places. I totally get the reasons for leaving. Okay, employee records. I would glance at this slide before the test. Um, It shows you the things that your employer is responsible for tracking for you. One of the things that Amber, I think it was, put in the chat room was she was a little bit confused about the cumulative earnings. That can be confusing. When we get to the payroll register, I'll show you what that's all about and how to compute them. Um, And now we have a provision where we have to prove that the employee is a United States citizen or has a valid work permit. There are forms to do that as well. We already worked on computing gross wages. We're going to practice that again today. We have already worked on these various withholdings that are required by law. We will also work on that again today. We talked about calculating Medicare, which is a straight percentage. I think it's probably the easiest to compute out of the taxes, but we'll work on that again today. And we talked about that federal income tax put forth by an amendment to the Constitution. I think it's a 16th Amendment, and it tells us how we need to do a pay-as-you-go system. And the whole goal at the end of the year is to square up when you file your 1040 tax return. If you've done it just right, maybe you get a little bit of refund, maybe you owe a little bit more money, but the goal is to about break even. If you find that you owe a bunch at the end of the year, you need to change your withholding allowances. If you find that you're getting a large refund at the end of the year, that is not wise either. That means you're letting the government use your money interest-free during the year instead of changing your withholding allowances and have less withheld, and we've looked at that table together, we'll look at it again today, the more exemptions you claim, we saw on that table, the less allowances are withheld. You can change that at any time. I told you that I drove Cerritos College nuts at a time when I was ill and um, changing my W4 exemptions several times during the period so that I could get more money back to help me pay my medical bills, and then I knew I would square up, we talked about that term before, with the government at the end of the year. That's called a circular E. I hope that's in your notes. I'm going to write it down. We'll look at it again today. We talked about what a withholding allowance is. It's a portion of income that is not subject to taxes. Typically, although this is not the way it has to be, Typically, people claim themselves a spouse and dependents, although it does not have to be that way. If you have another chunk of income that you know is not going to be subject to taxes, you can bump up your withholding allowances. Okay, somebody, several people asked me in an email over the weekend, what do you mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. Um, If you give quite a bit to charity, for example, you're gonna have a chunk of deductions that brings your income down. If you know that about yourself and you know that your taxes are gonna be less at the end of the year because you donate a bunch of money during the year, you might wanna bump up your allowances. Maybe if I'm, I am married, but I claim single with one, maybe I wanna bump that up to married, but claiming the single rate with three or four. 
in the hopes of, again, breaking even at the end of the year. And your um, payroll division at whatever company you work at will accept that, not complain about it. You're in control of that. In fact, here's the form that we're talking about. Here's that W-4 form. They have totally overhauled it this past year. It is a hundred more times complicated than it ever was before. It went from being half of a page to being several pages long now. Um, I've had several family members have me help them fill out a W-4 form when it used to be something you can just glance at and know the answer to. We, here's that circular E, publication 15. I think I may have accidentally said 17. It's publication 15, circular E. And that's the one where the number of withholding allowances are across the top and the gross pay is along the side. We'll be using that again. You do need to pay attention to how often your payroll period is. The author gives us weekly payroll, but there's also tables for monthly and other out, um, by monthly different payrolls that you can find the table for. And let's see. Here's the other voluntary deductions. Um, some of you might have this taken out of your paycheck. I know I have several taken out of mine. These are ones where you need to authorize the employer to take these amounts out. Um, life insurance, in case you want your employer to help you get a life insurance policy, they will do that. Usually you have to pay for it unless it's a benefit. Any type of medical insurance plan that you're going to pay into, Company retirement plans brings up that 401k. Just know that I have added an extra link based on some great questions I got from students over the weekend. Uh, you could contribute to a bank or a credit union. You can even buy savings bonds. You might have a loan repayment. I remember Cerritos years ago allowed us to buy a computer. Um, they would fund the price of the computer, but we had to pay them back out of our paycheck. That's an example of a loan repayment where the employer fronts some type of a cost for you and you agree to pay it back. In that case, I think it was without interest is why I took advantage of that. And many of us have union dues. And so you would have that deducted from your paycheck. Here's what we're going to look at today. We're going to be looking at a payroll register. And one of the things that is often confusing to students is the question that somebody put in the chat room the cumulative earnings. So we will address that. Let me explain what a payroll register does. This only shows par part of it because it's so wide that it doesn't fit on the screen. So it has one line per employee and it's really similar to the problem we did at the end of class last time, except it goes horizontally across instead of vertical down. So usually what's on here is the number of allowances you claim, whether you're married or single, cumulative earnings is how much you have made prior to this pay period. So if this payroll register was done near the end of December, I'm not sure what the date was, then what I had earned through November, let's say, would show up in the cumulative earnings column. We're gonna do an example. And then whatever I make this payroll period, is added to it and the employer keeps track of your cumulative earnings to date. Most of us, including me, that get a payroll check, we can look towards the bottom and we'll see YTD usually or year to date. And the, the source for that is this payroll register where they keep track of what you've earned after every paycheck. And I think the next slide might, it might be one of the next two slides. So here's the cumulative earnings before and here's the cumulative earnings, I think. Um, let me go back to the previous slide. Somebody did have a question on this. I don't think they showed us the cumulative earnings after, but we'll do an example because I, I, I agree that that was a little confusing. Um, so we'll be completing this payroll register momentarily, but that is the document that typically um, supports the big journal entry that is made. And again, I'll be demonstrating this to you in today's major problem. We do have to record the payroll um, and the journal entry can be long. You saw that towards the end of the last class session, you saw the big journal entry for payroll and then the payment of the payroll to the um, 
employees will be doing that also. But here, for example, is where the gross pay comes from. It's usually from the last far right hand side of the payroll register where you can choose a column on where you want to charge the gross wages. It looks like on this company, they have office workers and they have shipping workers. And so if you want to track the wages separately, the far right hand side of the payroll register is generally where they give you the opportunity to do that. That's why you see two debits to wages expense or salaries expense here. They, this company has split them up. And I'm still looking for um, that cumulative wages. We're just gonna have to wait until, Amber, we're gonna have to wait until we get into our example today for me to demonstrate that. But I promise you, um, it'll be clear after I demonstrate it. So any other questions on those PowerPoint slides? That's kind of a recap of where we've been. And now we'll jump into today's new stuff. Anybody have any questions? Um, Amber asked if it's the amount earned plus the amount of current earnings. Yeah, so it is the cumulative earnings before the payroll period plus the gross pay that you earned for this current payroll period. That's exactly what it is. And I'll demonstrate that to you in a minute. It's exactly what it is. This is why it's so good when I can get as many people as possible to join the class because you guys come up with some great questions that just doesn't come up if I'm recording a, a lecture to nobody, if I'm talking to the wind per se, or if I'm doing a pre-recorded lecture, I don't have those great questions coming in. That's why you guys have no idea how much I appreciate you coming into the classroom. All right, let's go take a look at the um, Excel files for today. And you'll notice that the very first tab or the first worksheet is what we did in class last time. Um, and I wanted to go over an analyze question that came up probably four or five times this weekend on emails that I got from students. So, and somebody also came to class early today asking the same question. So I, I put it on the screen and we can talk about how would you do it? Let me move this over. So it's the analyze question. Those ones are always uh, a little bit more challenging. They make us critically think. So I'm, I kind of typed it in my shorthand right before the class started up here. You guys can refer in your book if you want to see an example of it. Um, it is page 351. Let me write that down there. Page 351. And basically what it said, this is what it says. Alan had made 29,260 prior to this payroll period. Okay, so Alan's been working there a while. He's made this much year to date. And here's what the question says. Based on his cumulative earnings, including this paycheck that we just did, and we calculated his earnings to be 728 last time. Here's the question. How much overtime pay did he earn? Okay, here's how you would solve that. We want to take a look at how much regular pay he would have earned over the year. And this is assuming that there was no increase in rate or anything. So his rate was $14 an hour. So here's how I'm going to um, suggest you do this. First thing is his cumulative earnings year to date. I gave that to you $29,260. i am going to document that. $29,260. Two sixty, and I'm going to put year to date. Hmm, maybe I need to widen that column because it disappeared. There it is. Let me widen this column so you guys can see it. Okay, there is his year to date earnings before this payroll period. Okay, and he earned 728 during this last paycheck. So I'm going to put this payroll, 728. So if I total that, and this kind of goes back to, I think it was Amber's question, his cumulative earnings year to date after that, sec after that payroll check would be the sum of these two. Now we haven't answered the question he posed to us yet. 
So I'm partially answered it so far. His, here's his total cumulative earnings so far year to date. I'll make that bigger so you can see it. That's what he has made so far. The author wants to know how much of that was for overtime earnings, right? Well, people are looking through the book going, how in the world do I calculate this? Okay, this is how you do it. And I was explaining this to another um, student in the classroom. You take his regular pay, which I think was $14, out, $14 an hour. I have to go look. I'm sorry, my memory is fried today. It is $14 an hour. So we're gonna take his regular pay rate of $14 per hour, and we're gonna multiply by 40 regular hours in the work week, right? And that would give you his regular without time check, the one that he would get every, every month. So let me do that, 14 times 40 would be 560 would be his regular pay. And because he gets paid weekly and there's 52 weeks in a year, we're gonna take that amount and we're gonna multiply by 52. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm taking that 560 that he would bring in on a normal 40 hour work week and I'm gonna multiply it by 52 because there's 52 weeks in a year. So here's his total regular pay that he would earn. Okay, let me do the math. 560 times 52. I got 29,120. Here's what you do next. You compare the cumulative earnings, how much he has made so far year to date with the regular earnings that we just computed and the difference must be due to overtime. Okay, so we can compute overtime by taking the difference. Okay, so in words, what we've done is we've taken the total cumulative gross pay less the total cumulative regular pay. That's those two yellow boxes. And when I do that, when I take the difference, and then I'll show you the bottom of my screen in case I moved it too quickly. When I take the difference between those two, his overtime must have been 868. Now, of course, your numbers are algorithmic, which means they change from student to student. So that doesn't necessarily mean that is the answer um, on your homework. It's the answer with these figures. So I know a couple of you struggled with that. I answered quite a few emails showing you the calculation, but I'm glad somebody reminded me in class today so that we could show it for everyone. Does anybody have any questions on that one? That's a problem we worked on last time in class. We went through the whole thing. We even did the journal entries. Um, but we didn't look at the analyze question. And of course, that's what people struggled with this weekend. That's another great reason for you guys to come back to class so that we can address those types of issues. Okay, not hearing any questions. Let me move on then to 10.6. Okay, I wanted to make sure that we had a couple of opportunities to cover the journal entries because as I mentioned in the last class, this is the longest journal entry you will probably see. Um, definitely in this class, I was thinking about 101 and 102, it's probably the longest journal entry you're gonna see in the accounting classes that you're taking at Cerritos. Okay, so in order to have enough time to do the payroll register, what I did on this exercise is I put in yellow totals, okay, for you. In other words, I added these straight across. So there's two employees in this company. One's called Queen, one's called Tender. I don't know how they come up with some of these names. I just added them across and they want you to do um, two journal entries. And I would highlight this one because these are the two journal entries covered in the chapter. So it's a really good review. So here's what we want to do. We want to refresh our, mom, our memory on how do you do the journal entry to record the payroll. That's what number one asks us to do. So I'm going to entitle this 
journal entry to record the payroll. That's number one. Okay, it's a long journal entry. You saw me demonstrate it in the last class period, even though the book didn't ask us to do it. We did it to give you guys a, a head start on the homework. So step one, one big debit to a wages or salaries expense. We're assuming that these two employees worked in the same department. It's possible again, if you have sales and let's say warehouse employees, you may have more than one debit, but in total, we want to debit the wages or salaries expense for whatever the gross pay is. So right now I'm looking at this gross wage number and I'm gonna do um, the journal entry that it asks us to do by debiting, I would use wages expense. I was gonna see um, what the author used. He uses office salaries expense. I'm not sure, oh yes, here it is. They did tell us that these are office employees, so that would be appropriate. So here's the big debit, office salaries expense. They are synonymous. You could use office wages expense also. They are synonymous, you can use either one. And then what we wanna credit here is each one of these deductions that are withheld from our paycheck represent a liability, okay? And I had a couple students ask me over the weekend, they said, you know, I really don't understand why these aren't expenses. And here's what my answer was to the person that asked this. We have accounted for our wages. It's 2020, that's the company's cost just in wages of paying us. These monies are coming out of our pocket. They're not coming out of the employer's pocket. They're coming out of our pocket. So our employer is acting as a conduit or a flow through to these other state and federal entities. So because that's our money and they are taking it away from us, this creates a liability that they owe to these other entities. That's why we're using liability accounts. So I'm just gonna go right down the list. There is no special order of the credits. I'm gonna go down the list in the order they gave them to us. So we would have a social security tax payable for that 2930. And so that these all look nice and neat, I'm gonna to go to the gray area up here, what we call the headers on an Excel worksheet or the column headings, you may hear it called. I'm gonna click the little comma format to make our numbers look a little nicer for us. So we have the social security tax payable. We have the Medicare tax payable. Basically, if there's, and I put the wrong number. Basically, if there's some money that is withheld from us, it creates a liabilities on the employer's books. So I'm gonna go grab that Medicare tax and then going back, over there, it's income tax. I believe your book uses employee income tax payable. On my books, I just have income tax payable. It's understood that it's from the employee's paychecks, 303. The rest of it, that's what they owe to us as the employees. That's what's referred to as this net pay. This is net and it's gonna fund or feed this last liability account called salaries. It could be wages payable. In this case, it's salaries payable and it is what balances this out. So um, I'm gonna go grab that amount and I'm hoping that it is the same amount this is the reason why I shouldn't even look at the answer book. Here's what happened. This net pay added up the wrong thing. Let me fix it. Sorry for the typo there. Let me sum up these two lines of net pay. That looks a lot better. There is the net pay. That's what's gonna go to salaries payable. It's like they were added instead of subtracted. When you have a compound entry like this, that means when you, when you have more than just a debit or a credit, you might wanna take the extra minute and add these up to make sure that they fit. I'm talking about on an exam, take the extra minute or two 
and foot the journal entries to make sure that the debits equal the credits. That's the journal entry. That's the biggest journal entry in this chapter, the journal entry to record the payroll. Questions? You're welcome. This will fund, by the way, this payroll register that we're keeping will fund, will feed the W-2 form, which is sent out to all of us at the year, at the end of the year. That's what all of us use to either prepare our own taxes or some of us just take it into HR block and have it uh, prepared for you. By the way, just so you guys know, in non-COVID times, Cerritos College prepares taxes free. Um, the accounting students through VITA, V-I-T-A is the name of it, or VITA, some people call it, Volunteer Income Tax Association. You can come in and get your tax taxes prepared for free. Um, by students that are supervised by CPAs. So keep a lookout for that. It was a great program that we had when COVID hit, the school severely limited um, people that we can bring on campus. So to my knowledge, we don't have that coming up next year. If I hear differently, of course, I'll pass that along. The second journal entry here, because we're not done, says prepare the journal entry to summarize the checks to pay the payroll, right? So usually the payroll is done ahead of time, right? And I think I told you last time, there was a time when my company was paying 83 people. That's not something you want to do the night before. So usually the payroll is prepared ahead of time. And then when payday comes around and you release the payroll checks, that's when the employees are gonna start either cashing their checks or mostly now it's by direct deposit. So when we pay the payroll, here's what we do. We get rid of the liability and that's where we credit the cash account because especially if it's direct deposit, all those amounts are gonna come out of our cash account on payroll day. So there's two journal entries, one to record the payroll and the journal entry to pay the payroll. That's that second one. Those are the two major journal entries out of the chapter. They tend to be long. And in fact, if you were to look at my paycheck, I have so many other things taken out of my paycheck that Cerritos College would probably have a line that's 15 lines long for different things. That's the journal entry that tends to intimidate students. If you understand that each one of these lines is just a liability off the payroll register or off whatever document you're using to record the payroll, it makes it less intimidating. So if the employer is withholding anything from you for any reason, that creates a payable. The only exception to that rule that I can think of is a payback of uh, a debt that you owe the, the employer and that's something for another class. Okay, here is the major problem we're doing today. It's probably the longest problem we'll do all semester long. So I tried my best to give you um, a spreadsheet that mimicked the payroll register. It's not 100% because there's so many columns on there that we don't use in this chapter but it's very similar to what the payroll register looks like in the book. So it's a big, long, wordy problem. I gave you the problem in the last tab. And what I did in the hope of easing um, the complexity of trying to keep all of this on one screen, I went ahead and I copied all these things, the hours, the rate, the marital status and the withholding allowances. And Marguerite asked a good question that comes from the W-4 form, remember? And they gave us the cumulative earnings. Okay, somebody, Amber, I think asked a question. This is what they've made prior to this payroll check. So we're gonna enter this. I think I probably have entered it in the payroll register. And after we're done, doing this last payroll of the year, we'll have to update the cumulative earnings year to date. And that information is what's gonna be transferred over to the W-2 form that you and I as employees get at the end of the year, which summarizes everything we've made and all the different deductions that our employer has taken out. So here's the wording for the problem. 
I wanted to point out something to you because a lot of people miss this in the instruct instructions. Requirement five here. I want to focus your eyes on that one. Because those circular E's are only go up to a certain amount. In other words, if they were to give you all the circular E's, it'd be this thick and they didn't want to um, load up the book with a bunch of tables. They gave us one page out of the circular E. So what they told us is we already know what the income tax withholdings for two of these employers are. Because they fall off the chart, these people made more money than the other people that worked at the company. They're going to give you the income tax withholdings for two people. Okay, so right now I'm going to go fill this in on the payroll register for two people. It says that it's 235 for Easley and 238, I think that says for Perio. So I'm going to go over to this payroll register. And I'm going to put in there 235 and 238 under the federal income tax. I got to get on the same line. Line 12, as I move this over. In fact, why don't I freeze these so this doesn't drive us crazy? You guys can freeze it with me. If you don't want your, if you don't want this information to scroll as you scroll, we're going to freeze the panes. So if you're not sure how to do that in Excel, you can do it with me. I'm going to go to the place I want the panes to freeze, which is on G8 right here. And I'm going to go to view, the view tab of Excel. And there's a freeze panes. I'm going to freeze these. So now when I scroll over, I can still see the names of these other people. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in those withholdings that they gave us for those last two people. So for easily, I believe they said it was 235. And for the last person, it was 238. And I'm going to write in here given. So you won't be sitting there wondering where did that information come from? Because what they made on this payroll period falls off the chart that they gave you in the book. So rather than give you a bunch of charts to look up, they just gave us these th this two pieces of information on the federal tax. Okay, having got through that, let's fill in this earnings and we'll also answer this question that came up over the weekend and also by Amber today, we'll answer the question, how did we come up with those cumulative earnings? Okay, I'm gonna do the first one with you and then you guys are going to compute the last three. I'm going to be quiet while you do that. But I'm going to do at least the first one with you. And then the rest of this, I'm going to give you guys a chance to do, and we'll compare answers at the end. Okay, so Betty Brooks worked 45 hours. 40 of those hours, because of the Fair Labor Standards Act, would be paid at the regular rate of 1280. The other five hours would be paid at time and a half. So here's my calculation for that. So I'm doing my best right now to show you the calculation with the numbers, and then I'm gonna let Excel do the math so I don't mess it up. As you guys know, I tend to transpose numbers because of the learning disability, so I have to work really hard at that and don't want you guys to suffer along with that. So I got 512 for the regular pay. And on your calculator or on Excel, five times 1280 times 1.5, that 1.5 is there. That means time and a half for any hours worked over the five, uh, over the 40. In this case, she worked five. And when I do that, I got 96. So her total gross wages, remember what that means. These are her wages before any deductions. I'm going to add these two up. It would be 512 plus 96. And I'll go show you my work here. Make this bigger. So give myself some room. So the way I calculated that was the 512 plus the 96. I got 608. Let me go double check and make sure that I don't make any silly transposition errors. And here's the question that came up a lot. People were dumbfounded on how do we get these cumulative earnings? Okay, 
this in the pink column is what Betty had made prior to this pay period. And over here in the gross wage column, she just made $608 more. So what has she made year to date would be a better word, but it could be in the middle of a payroll period. That's why they didn't use year to date. In this case, it would be what she made before this, 44,179, plus the gross that she just made this pay period. So I've written it down on how we came up with the calculation. And now I'm gonna let the computer compute it by adding those two cells together. You can check 44,787. And Amber, if you're still in the room, let, uh, let me know if that explains your question. I hope it does. This next set of columns, I'm gonna highlight it so you can see in a different color. This next set of columns in blue on my example are the deductions. These are the things that they take out of our paycheck. This is our money coming out of our paychecks so that the employer can be the conduit or be the funnel to the other entities that they owe this money to. Okay, remember the rates. And just like um, the example that the book gave you, um, that's what's going to happen on the test. I'm going to give you the rates and I'm going to give you the maximum. So there's nothing you need to memorize. So social security is 6.2%. That is current. That's what it is right now. So I'm going to write this in a percentage form so that it shows up. And the rate for Medicare, which is given to you in the problem language is 1.45%. And the federal tax we have to look up using circular E. So anything you see in the blue area is based on this gross wage line. So this 608, I'm gonna highlight it in yellow for our first person. It's very important that you get the gross wages right because if you miss it, the rest of the problem is gonna be wrong. Okay, so social security, is 608. I'm going to go, um, well, let me show it to you first, make it bigger so it stands out. So this is 608 times 6.2%. If you don't have a calculator that has a percentage, you move the decimal place two to the left. Um, somebody else said, can I divide it by 100? Yes, same thing. The Medicare is also going to be based on the 608 and we'll multiply it by the Medicare percentage there. So let's go ahead and calculate that. I'm going to let the computer do it. 608 times 6.2%. I got 3770. Again, let me go take a look and make sure that that is right. Yes, and Medicare is gonna be the 608 times the 0.0145, as I wrote down, we got $8.82. The federal income tax, we're gonna to have to go look at in the circular E. Okay, the circular E is gonna be referenced in your homework. I hope that the, the um, author didn't boot me out. What we're gonna to have to remember is that this person is married with three and she made 608. Okay, so she's married with three and she made 608. Let me see if um, it kept the file open or if it closed out on me. Here it is. So you guys have this table in your book. We're gonna go down to married and we're gonna go look at her wages, which were 608. And we're going to take our finger down this three. Remember, she was married with three. So I'm going to keep my little finger, my hand on that. And what I'm looking for is the 608 that she made. I'm looking off to the left hand side. That's how we use this table. So when I keep my cursor down here, it says between 600 and 610 would be $27. That would be her withholding. So let me stop 
and see if anybody has a question. Otherwise, I'm going to put that I got $27 and I not $2,700, $27. And I got that from the circular E. Professor Johnson? Yes. Um, Amber asked if you can please redo the earnings. The cumulative earnings right here? Yes. Yes. Okay. The way I came up with that, Amber, is I took the cumulative earnings that Betty had made coming in, 44179 that was given to us in the problem, and I added to that the gross wages that she just made, oh, in this payroll period, and that might be, no, that's right. Um, so, so 44179 is the pink box, plus the 608 is how I came up with 44787. And Giselle or Sandra, would you recalculate that just to make sure that we did it correctly? I got all the same numbers. Okay. Okay, good. So Amber, that's how we came up with it. It's what she made to date, which was given. Oh, great. I saw Margarita. Thumbs up. Thank you. Um, plus 608. Sandra, that was thumbs up. Awesome. Okay. So again, these, this is our money. We've earned $608. And rather than our employer giving us the 608 that we earned, they're taking three mandatory deductions out. This person doesn't live in the state of California or there would be a fourth and fifth actually, but there would be a fourth for sure. So the total deductions, how much did we have withheld from our payroll checks is the sum of, in this case, the 3770 that they withhold for social security, the 882 that they withheld for Medicare, and the $27 that they withheld for our federal income tax withholding. And when you add those up, I'm trying to avoid any kind of a rounding error that Excel is gonna give me. So I'm adding them up the hard way by entering them in. I got 73.52 in total deductions. So my net pay, which is what you may hear referred to as take home, is going to be, and I'll put a little number out to the side here so I don't have to squeeze it all in. That is the gross less the deductions. Okay, in our case for Betty, if I have to back up so you can see it, it is the, let me get my arrows here, it is the 608 less the total deductions there of 73.52. I'm gonna let the computer do it again so I don't transpose numbers. 608 minus those deductions. I think I put it in the wrong spot. So, oh, let me just type it out. 608 minus the federal tax would be 581. That doesn't sound right. So, oh, I know why there's probably not decimal places. Let me try it again. 608 minus 7352, 534.48. Let's make sure we all get that. That's how you do a payroll register. Basically, it is a horizontal calculation of payroll and there's one line for each employee. So in the example that I used earlier, I'd have 73 lines, one for each employee and then I would do one big journal entry at the very end to record the payroll, number one, and then to pay the payroll, just like we did previously. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to mute myself. I could hear my husband screaming across the room. It's about time. So I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to let you calculate these last three people, and then we will compare notes. Any questions before I do that? Okay, go for it. I'm gonna be quiet as soon as I remember how to mute myself. Okay, it's just in the textbook. You guys all have the ebook. So what you can do um, to find this, I think it was Magdalena's whose voice I heard. If you go to the homework and you open it up and you go to this problem 10-2B, there's probably a link um, to link up to those circular E's. So and on an exam, it'll be just like the homework where you can click on the link and find it. In chapter 10? Yes. Okay. 
Yes. You also have it in the ebook. I can probably, I don't think the author will allow me to copy it, but I can probably go do it on a scanner and put it in. If you think that would help, I'll be happy to put that in the, in the modules as well. It changes all the time. That's why I hesitate to do it because it's constantly updated, but I can definitely do that. Right. Okay. Uh, so I'm just looking for it. Oh, I think I see it. Yeah, if you open up your homework to one of the problems we worked on last time that asked for federal tax, you can click on it and it'll pop up. You said 10.2 um, or is it another one? Because I see figure 10.2 showing the one with married. Um, there should, if you scroll up or down, there should be also a single. Yeah, I don't have it in this one. It's not a live link in the homework one, but there is a married and a single. Or if you go to the ebook and you type in page 332 at the top, you can like click at the page number and you type in 332 and 333, you should, you should see the tables. Um, Amber just said that in question number four for chapter 10, it has both links. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, question number four on the homework. Question Magdalena, one of your classmates, just let you know that question four has the links for both. So if you want to open up your homework, Magdalena, Amber said that the uh, links for both married and single are in that one. Yeah, I see it now. Okay, great. Thank you. Too. You're welcome. Well, everyone. Okay, Magdalena, you might want to mute yourself. I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to finish by totaling these up and then we'll do the journal entry together. Okay, I am going to remove the um, freezing so that we can see the whole thing. So I'm going to go back to view and I'm going to unfreeze my panes so that you can see the whole thing. And if you guys don't know how to do totals in Excel, the total feature is extremely important because it'll keep you from having to do a bunch of extra work. So if you're not sure how to do that, I'm going to do the first one with you and we're going to drag it all the way across so that we don't have to mess with any of the other totals. So I'm going to do it for the gross pay, but it works the same for any of these. You type in equals SUM and hit an open parentheses. The open parentheses is the one on the number nine key. You have to press the shift to access it. So equal sum like that. And then you can highlight what it is you want the computer to add up. I'm going to highlight from here to here and press enter. And then once you get that first total, you can use this little fill handle. And I think I've showed you this before, but if I haven't, it moves from a fat cross in the middle, that's a regular cell selector, to a very thin black cross when you move it to the corner. See how it moves from a fat cross to a thin cross? When you see that thin cross, um, click the left mouse button, button, hold it down, and just drag it all the way across to the end, and you'll get these totals. You may be off by a cent or two on these. <clears throat> excuse me, it is a rounding feature. Um, that's an Excel issue. There's ways to get around it, but I'm not going to mess with bothering you with that detail now. Don't worry about it if you are a penny or so off. <clears throat> Connect, excuse me, has tolerances built into it so that it should not care either. If you come across a rounding error and you're just certain that, that you got it right, email me and I'll double check it for you. And if anybody gets knocked off, you know, like a 10th of a percentage or point or something because of a rounding issue, we will fix that. So don't worry about the rounding. So compare your totals to my totals. Know that they may be off by a penny or so. We don't care. I'm going to get rid of this cumulative earnings number because I think it will distract from the journal entry that I'm going to show you now. So the last part of this is getting this into the books, right? So you, have, you would have one line for each employee, and then we totaled it up. On my spreadsheet, the totals are in red so that you can see them. 
the last thing we want to do on this is we need to get this payroll into the journal. So we're going to do two journal entries, just like we did in that other problem. One journal entry to record the payroll and the second journal entry to record the payment of the payroll. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with the first journal entry to record the payroll. This is what goes to the wages or salaries expense. Your book in this one uses wages expense. If you use salary expense, that would be totally fine too. And I'm gonna make this bigger so you can see it. Give me one second to make the font a little bigger. Okay, the wages expense, I'm gonna put it in parentheses. This is the gross pay. This is what you cost your employer in terms of just your gross pay. So I'm gonna go grab that number, which I've calculated. Okay, let me make that bigger. If you see those um, number signs in Excel, it means that your column is not wide enough to hold the number. So that's where the first big debit comes from. So now remember how we're gonna strategize this. Remember how we're gonna do it. Every blue column that has a deduction in it gives rise to a liability account because it's our money that the company is withholding and needs to pass it over to whatever government entity they pay the tax to. So I have three blue columns. That means that the next part of my journal entry is gonna be those three payables. So first one, and these don't have to be in any particular order, social security tax payable. I'm gonna go grab that number. Okay, and it looks like I probably need to make those bigger. I'm not gonna worry about that. And Medicare tax payable. I'm gonna go grab this other number. So with arrows, so you can see what, where these are coming from. We're just using a little drop down system here and every payable that's been withheld, we're just putting into a liability account. Life was nice before this chapter because basically we dealt with accounts payable. I think that was really the only payable we ever dealt with. Maybe a note payable in the bank rec chapter. But now in payroll, everything that's taken out of the paycheck lends itself to a liability account. And my final one here is federal income tax payable. I remember your author uses a really strange word. I think it was employee income tax payable. I think I use FIT on my books, federal income tax payable. 550. Let me make this look decent. I'll, we'll do dollars and cents like we're used to seeing journal entries. And then what's left here to balance this out, because right now we would not balance out. If we foot our debits and credits, they would not equal. What's missing is the net pay. That's what they owe to their employees when it comes payroll day. We'll call that wages payable. And again, we may be off by a penny or so. We could go in and find out exactly where that is. I'm not too worried about it right now. So the wages payable would be my net pay over here. And if we flip that, we should be within a penny. I think we might be a penny off, so we could arbitrarily change one of these numbers. And again, let me make that look a little decent. This is, let me put it in my description, the journal entry to record the payroll. Remember that if you didn't quite finish, maybe you're brand new to payroll and you're taking a little bit longer, remember that Sandra or give you guys a chance to ask questions to compare your totals with mine. Then the last journal entry then would be to pay the payroll. When payday comes around and they release the checks or if it's a direct deposit, they release the funds. Then what happens is we have to get rid of the liability and credit our cash account because all that money is going to be coming out of our cash um, on payroll day. And that would be again for that yellow number. Okay, so that would be the journal entry to pay the payroll. I'll write that down. 
This is the journal entry to pay the payroll. Let me make this all the same size because it's very bad to have things a different size when you're creating a spreadsheet. It's hard to do so many things at once, talk, format, think about Excel. So bear with me. I'll make this a little bit bigger so it shows up for you. That is the chapter on payroll. That is the folk at your author split it up again. These are the taxes that you and I as employees pay. Chapter 11 is going to be one of the easiest chapters I think we have because there are four taxes that the employer pays and two of them are matching. They're these two. They pay the exact same thing for Social Security and Medicare. So that means that the next chapter is really about two new taxes that are called unemployment taxes and workers comp. And there's not much in it. My guess is we may not even take the full class time next time to go over chapter 11 and the homework for chapter 11 that we'll talk about when you guys come back next time will probably take you less than an hour. So what questions do you guys have on anything you heard me discuss or do you have a payroll question that you haven't heard me discuss?